Well, talk about an honor. Okay, so is that too loud? No? Um, talk about an honor. I got to uh, crit Hope Studio, a few members of Hope Studio today, or Studio that I took at GST, similar program, mm -hmm. 15 years ago, which is really extraordinary. Hope was one of the um, four female mentors I had at GST that really inspired me um, and taught me a ton. I think I saw a lot of, um, you know, it's just weird to see a studio 15 years later and see where you are in your lives and remembering that part of my life. It was really special. So, um, and uh, this sort of network of women that I met at GST that were my faculty are now teaching at you know, Texas and Ohio and LSU and just like this network of amazing people. So what an honor to be here. Um, up on the screen, I have my um, Twitter handle, at DMariePoresLA, um, Poetics of Architects. Um, I offer to you that if you tweet a great photo or a great thought from tonight's um, talk, that I will offer up something in exchange, whether that's a portfolio review or career advice. I'm, one of my professional goals is to be the landscape architect with the most Twitter followers in the country. <laughs> <laughs> and I am trailing behind Kate Orff, and it's killing me. <laughs> so, so please follow me. It would mean a lot. <laughs> and please don't tell Kate that I've offered the landscape architect Twitter smackdown. Um, so Hope gave a little introduction. I'm at Sasaki Associates out of Watertown, Massachusetts. Um, and I have been there close to 20 years. Um, it is an interdisciplinary practice at its core. It was really started on the principle that interdisciplinary practice is what can solve kind of wicked, complex problems. Interestingly, we are about 270 people, 263 of which are all out of our Watertown, Massachusetts office. It's really hard for us, it's been hard in the past, to replicate our culture to different offices. So we really love being under one roof together, uh, this group of practitioners. Um, but we do have one small project office in Shanghai that's really about translating our planning work in China to built work. But again, at its core, it's about um, a really unique concept of practice that there's no dominant discipline, that every discipline brings excellence to the table and equity to the table, that we all have an equal voice. So we're organized by studio, we're also organized by discipline, and our disciplines are purposefully kept uh, the same scale and the same size, and are purposefully all trying to achieve the highest levels of excellence. So we have architecture interiors, urban design planning, and landscape and civil engineering, which we call site as an organization. But we practice in studios, which are meant to be a kind of interdisciplinary overlay. So half of the office practices in the campus studio, half practices in the urban studio. Um, just a shout out on the campus, one of our most noteworthy projects of the past 10 years, I'm looking at Ian Steiner, um, is the UT campus master plan, which was a great effort and one of our most celebrated and um, exciting campus master plans. It's a big part of the work we do is working with institutions who are experiencing change. This plan then went on to generate the need for a campus landscape master plan, which I had the great pleasure of um, touching fairly lightly. I came here for a few sessions and um, had the great joy of working with uh, Professor Shearer and the dean and a committee um, to really think about the campus landscape and how it was adapting to change particularly thinking about issues of drought and climate change and what that would mean. And I just wanted to put this up because we lost Mark Simmons this past year and he was an extraordinary part of this effort, really looking at landscape in a different way through the lens of <coughs> ecology and how could we think different, for instance, this example of LBJ Library, move away from the mown lawn and into something that has habitat value and less maintenance requirements. But I'm not gonna talk about that because I'm really gonna focus on some of the urban work um, or the urban studio, as Hope says, we have all of the disciplines. We practice all over the country, all over the world. Actually, the international work we do falls within my studio. Uh, it's about 80 practitioners from every discipline. I'm showing you just two small examples of the kind of work that we do. This was the post-Sandy recovery work from Hurricane Sandy. Our team looked at the Jersey Shore um, and the revitalization of that economy through rapid sea level rise and climate change related issues. But we also build, um, I think our reputation um, for planning really precedes us everywhere we go, but we believe in constructing the ideas that we plan. And so this was a master planning effort at the Port of Los Angeles that has been under construction. This first phase opened in 2011. I'm working on the next phase of construction right now. And so um, the idea is really this planning to build um, sort of feedback loop that we find so important. 
But what I want to talk about today are three projects that I've personally been very involved in and leading um, for the firm and um, really as a way of empowering landscape architects to understand the incredible range of scales with which we can practice. Um, so the name of my talk is Micro, Mega, Macro, and it's meant to say that we can practice at the small site scale all the way to the system scale and really have a powerful impact on urban change. I think a lot of times people think of architecture as being the driver of urban change, but really landscape is a really powerful force, and we're seeing that more and more across the country. So these projects will take you through a range of scale, but all of them at their core have this idea of urban catalyst, um, kind of urban change at heart. And I'm going to start with a little project called Alon on D. Um, has anyone heard of this? Oh, yeah, my husband, yep, he's been there. Anyone else? <laughs> By the way, my husband class is 72 UT. Go T-Center. Was it Longhorns? Go Longhorns. Yeah. yeah. What's that? Go Longhorns. I've had three meals here since I've been here, and they've all had tacos in them. I'm trying. Right, Jack? OK. So the La Nandi um, started as uh, an expansion plan for the Boston Convention Center, this incredible um, alien spaceship that landed in the Seaport District of Boston. You can see Boston um, across the 440 Channel off there to the left, our downtown. We have the Seaport District, which the mayor has dubbed the Innovation District, which really has been just a sea of parking and industrial uses for many years, but it's, it's seeing incredible dramatic change, a lot of development happening. The convention center um, has been there for quite some time. It's striving to be one of the top five convention centers in the country, and its market analysis showed that to do that, it needed to expand, believe it or not, 30 million square feet. They wanted to add kind of twice that and, um, to, the, to the facility, but really challenged by relationships with neighbors. Just off the screen to the bottom is the historic South Boston neighborhood. Um, think Goodwill Hunting and kind of the L Street pub. Um, and this connection really has been the connection to the harbor front for many years. When the convention center came here, that neighborhood was really up in arms about this big landing, this thing landing there. So um, our work was to look at this expansion and try to give it an urban context that embraced that connectivity and that neighborhood. So here you see just another view of it from the side. So our plan was really to think about this forgotten corridor called D Street, which runs on the east side of the convention center as a new mixed-use district that would be pedestrian-friendly, that would have amenity along it, that would have activated ground floor uses, something that's really missing in the Seaport District, that would connect this kind of fine-grained neighborhood of South Boston to the waterfront and start to break up those urban parcels into something that was a far better urbanism and a far more kind of walkable street. So here you see kind of that expansion to, this is a rough, not, <coughs> not our work, but it, a rough idea of the size of that expansion. And you see a series of new uses on the east side of the street really lining this idea of the walkable corridor. But what the, does this keep going on and off? Is it just me? No. No, it's okay? Okay. So, um, so the, idea, um, the idea was about this walkable street, and there were a series of open spaces that had always been, hi, Eric. <laughs> you're, on, you're in wait. It, it does keep going off, but I don't know why, so. Okay, yeah. it might be my necklace. Let me, let me take a look at it real quick. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. I feel like Iron Man. I have left something on my back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm gonna need you okay, to excuse me, hold on one second. <laughs> <laughs> the necklace is not a terrible idea. I can hold it, too. Not am I holding it. Let's that try that and see if that. Hold it? Okay, uh, so, so anyway, the, the idea, no, it's, <laughs> it's, it's off. I'm going to yell. I'm going to yell. Thank you, Eric. Thanks. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Always I expect something to go wrong with technology because it always will. Okay. Can you guys hear me still? Yeah. Okay. So the idea of this corridor, this idea of new uses along it, and then there was always this idea about an open space. An open space, and you can see it kind of roughed in there between the convention center and the street. Um, this idea that there could be a space that could be used by the community but also by the convention center in a weird kind of hybrid open space model. And a lot of our work was really working with the community to establish in that South Boston neighborhood what kinds of uses can coexist next to an alien spaceship convention center and this historic Boston neighborhood that would really get people to want to go hang out next to a convention center, which is, you know, no small feat. Um, and we also knew that this district would be changing over many years and that there would be periods of time when there would be construction going on. So it had to be something kind of a little bit unusual. Um, we also knew that given the way orchestration of kind of land change would happen, um, that, that the La Nandi um, would 
potentially even this open space would potentially move over time, that maybe it would be in one location and maybe that would get developed and then it would move. And so we set up this idea, why don't we take that kind of uh, experimental nature and really make an open space that embraces that, um, that experimental nature. So we took this two acre parcel, which at the time was kind of a pile of dirt and a parking lot. And we said, let's for the next two years, put down a really cheap landscape, a really inexpensive landscape and test a whole bunch of programmatic ideas and see what really sticks, what works for the convention center, what works for the community uh, and see if we can make something work. It was the lowest cost project I've ever done in my career at Sasaki. It was $11 a square foot. It was two and a half acres. We started designing it in December of uh, two years ago and it was built and opened in August of that year. So we had three months of design time and about five months of construction. Um, and the basic format was uh, a large lawn panel um, surrounded by asphalt and a plaza on the west side that would hold a temporary tent and some kind of signature lighting. We wanted one design element to really make it feel like it was a special place and not just pur purposely um, empty. And then kind of a frame, a buffer of planting that really enabled a little bit of screening from the street and from the convention center. And so uber simple, uber inexpensive, and as I said, it was designed and built uh, within that, that year and it was open to the public in August um, and had a small kind of quick August, September, October season, which I have to tell you, like blew everybody away, the kind of activity we got. So here you see, here's the plaza, um, which was asphalt, but we used tennis court paint to make this graphic pattern to give it some life and quality. We bought a whole bunch of cheap, um, colorful furniture. The tent is there um, for events, and then the l lighting is the only thing that was permanent, but we figured those could be disassembled and moved uh, later um, when, the, when the project changed. Here you are at the ground level. It was really interesting. Part of the idea was always that there's gonna be development of new hotels across the street, so could we create a connection between the hotels and the convention center? And it really all started with this idea of kind of a red carpet between them, and then that grew into the plaza, and then that grew into the lawn on D. So it was just sort of a strangely evolving scope. Here you see looking back at the convention center and to the tent, uh, which we worked with the consulting firm HRNA and they actually did a lot of the programming overlay after we had designed it. So they added this bar, which you can see in the back corner there, um, which I have to say is probably a big part of the success. It's one of the few fenced in open spaces in Boston that you can bring your kids and drink and <laughs> they can't get out. So uh, I know that I've done that there with our daughter and she loves it. Um, here's the plaza at night. So we designed the tr plaza just sturdy enough for two years of occupation of food trucks to come in and out. And the big idea of the programming was everything Boston, nothing from outside the city. So it's all Boston music, it's all Boston food. So these are Boston food trucks that come in five to 10 Thursday through Sunday. The lawn is really this ever changing place where we just sort of seeded it with um, inexpensive furnishings and uh, uh, people come here after work like crazy to play old fashioned games like cornhole and Jenga. It's just like the place to go and have a drink after work when the weather's nice. We have bocce courts that were sort of hand constructed to be sort of custom and cheap. Um, we were so thrilled by the success of the project in the first three months um, and so was the convention center that they actually did winter programming. Um, I don't know if those of you here paid attention to what happened to Boston two winters ago, <laughs> but we had 10 feet of snow that winter and the Lawn on D was like a hop in place. They actually built like a ski jump with the snow at one point. They had fire pits and hot chocolate. They had uh, grilled cheese trucks come out. Um, one of the main reasons why the project got so much attention was um, interestingly, uh, Howler and Yoon architects were hired to do a temporary art piece called Swing Time, uh, these adult sized uh, light up swings. I think Eric Harlow is here speaking next week. So I'll be curious to see if he shows this, but what an extraordinary project. Um, they are, you know, the first Swing Time 1.0 was like cheap plastic. They were like fell apart by the end of the summer. Swing Time 2.0 was a little bit more sturdy and actually it took um, our solar powered, which was really cool. And Swing Time 3.0 is coming out this summer and that's, they're still trying to figure out how to make them sturdy enough for the amount of use they get because it's always swinging. Um, and at night they light up and they become this really kind of special magnet in the city. You can imagine there was an article in the Boston Globe that was like, every 20 something year old woman has a picture of herself on the swings as her you know, profile <laughs> picture. It truly, it truly, it, someone called it the selfie capital of Boston, um, which led our cultural arts commissioner to ask like, is the, sel is the selfie really a signature of like cultural experience now? And I say, well, that's pretty good. 
pretty good. Um, they did winter programming, this ice maze. Um, you know, if you wanted to come watch Jaws on an inflatable raft, um, there was some of that. A little Edward Sharp and the Magnetic Zeros performed there, and then we had the inflatable bunnies. Um, so it, it's been this incredible, this is the end of this, this, of my three stories, that's the end of the first one, but the really interesting thing now is that the convention center got squashed by our governor. So we built this incredibly temporary cheap landscape that's very expensive to program, because that was the idea, we were gonna test program and build a cheap platform and test program. So the convention center got squashed, and now the question is just what to do, because now Bostonians have this expectation of this public space that has become this thriving open space, um, but this convention center doesn't want to still pay for all this programming. So they've actually hired us back again, and now we're doing an exercise to try to figure out how to build more revenue generation into this. So, so this summer, um, it will be called the Lawn on D powered by Citizens Bank, and Citizens Bank is actually paying for all the programming. I know, right? It's just this weird, ever-evolving story. Um, and so there'll be a corporate tent that can be rented off to the side of the lawn because that's been a big need. You get these big companies wanting to do. So it's, it's just, it's gonna keep going. And it, what's so interesting to me as a landscape architect is that we didn't design any of it to last. So the pavement's already buckling and the utilities are not good enough. And so um, again, we're sort of now catching up with it. But it's been this really kind of amazing, strange success story. Okay, so story number two. This is uh, the Chicago River Walk, which I've been working on since about 2009. Very different project. This is a thousand dollars a square foot and many years of toiling over the design work and uh, a very different condition. Um, for those of you that don't know Chicago, Chicago is famous for its Burnham um, plan of the city, which really established the lakefront and the riverfront and a series of boulevards as the open space network for the city. Um, Ray, Mayor Rahm Emanuel has shown himself to be someone who really polarizes people. He gets protested nonstop, but he's a lover of open space and investment in open space, which has been really extraordinary to work for him. We came in under Mayor Daley and then saw the change to Mayor Emanuel. He's been an incredible advocate for making downtown Chicago more livable. To the tune of many hundreds of millions of dollars, it was really telling at the ASLA this year in Chicago, you know, these projects have all opened in Chicago in the last two years, and each of them have between a fifty and hundred million dollar price tag. The M Michael Van Valkenburg's work at Maggie Daly and the 606, once called the Bloomingdale Trail, uh, field operations work at Navy Pier, and our work at the Chicago Riverwalk. So three, four kind of mega projects all about investment in landscape um, happening really simultaneously in one city is pretty extraordinary. And here's just a little glimpse. So all of them sort of share this idea that Chicago is moving towards a more livable downtown that's adding more for its residents. So playgrounds and trails and connectivity and places to eat and be. Um, Navy Pier is a really interesting study in how you take a tourism destination. I think it's the biggest tourist destination in the Midwest and make it into something that even the residents feel comfortable. People in Chicago don't think of Navy Pier as theirs. They think of it as the tourist spot, um, or as my client called it, the godforsaken Navy Pier. So <laughs> you know, how do you change something like that to be something that's more um, resident friendly? Um, our piece of the puzzle is the river walk. So it had already been um, constructed and completed from the lakefront, as you see here. Um, phase, uh, the east end was done back in the 90s. Uh, phase one was completed in the early 2000s. We were hired um, to work on phases two and three, which are the six blocks between State Street and Lake Street, making that final connection between the confluence of the Chicago River, which is a, has two, a north and south branch, so we were getting all the way to there. So you get from the lakefront all the way to Union Station without ever having to come up and cross a street. Uh, back to Daniel Burnham, um, he, here was his kind of understanding, really interesting kind of, uh, marriage of open space and civic mindedness with infrastructure. So um, th this is really a schematic of Wacker Drive, the Wacker Drive Viaduct, which if those of you don't know Chicago, the edges of the river are lined by a two level transportation infrastructure that's called Wacker Drive. The lower level is really service to the lower level of the city and the upper level is really kind of the city level, kind of the life of the city. So it's, it's got this really interesting, um, you know, kind of diagram to the way that works. And then it has this sort of civic facade of this kind of Beaux-Arts architecture and the sense of promenade. And you can see that in Burnham's vision for this upper level, lower level lacquer, in Burnham's vision, the, you know, the continuous experience along the river and you pass under and through the bridge houses and move along the riverfront. But that's not the way it was actually realized. So this is our project site here. When you see the bridge houses, you see the upper level of lacquer and then the lower level where there's staircases on either side, but there's no way to pass 
from space to space. You have to come up and down at every street intersection. And so that was really our charge, um, was to figure out how to connect that continuously uh, without making people come up. Um, and there had been work done to establish a build out line. So the Army Corps of Engineers, there's actually an act of Congress to change the navigable channel of the Chicago River, because it still does have barge traffic, as you see here, um, to enable a 25 foot build out and 20 foot build out in that, in that underbridge condition. So building new land in the river to make that connection was our charge. Some dynamics um, that make it complicated. You see here on the right hand side, just some of the flood data information. The Chicago River is a very engineered thing. It's not really like a river, it's more like a lake. Um, it actually runs the opposite way as it originally run. I think some, some of you might have heard about the reversal of the Chicago River. Um, it gets to a certain elevation, about elevation 3.5 from its normal pool of about negative two. So it's got about a five feet of uh, six feet of vertical change. When it hits that three and a half, the locks are deployed and the whole river drains to the lake, which they don't like to do because it's got sewage in it. Um, so, uh, but it gives us kind of a flood, flood plateau that we know everything above 3.5 will never touch water. So did the previous designers, and so you can see that they have their dock wall elevation, that lower <coughs> promenade at about elevation five, about a foot and a half above that flood elevation. So really good in one way, because it never floods, really bad in another, because there's no connection to the river. And that was something that we really felt strongly needed to be rethought. So we made the case, here are some existing condition photos of what it looked like when we started that this bulkhead wall was really preventing the city and the river from co coexisting and sort of touching each other and that we really needed to bring down that wall and really enable the life of the city and the life of the river to interact as you see in some of these precedents which were much more about getting people down to the water's edge. And the concept that we developed was really, you know, we looked at a whole bunch of studies about how to take this really unusual shape of these consistent 90 degree turns that was the Army Corps perimeter and make something meaningful out of it. Um, and it, the design departure was really when we stopped thinking about the path as following the architecture and started thinking about the, fa the path as actually something that could give form <coughs> to program, that it in its own shape and configuration could start to make different types of spaces in what we called the room, the kind of spaces between the bridge houses, which feel like distinct moments of time. Um, so you have these, um, and, then, and then the second kind of intervention was this idea of river typologies that we could think about ways people have historically interacted with rivers and you have some inspiration from that in terms of the kind of programming. So you see like the cove, for instance, which I'll show you in a second. And so this two ideas, this idea of a continuous path and then this other idea of these kind of unique river inspired themes was really the design concept. And this was it sort of uh, worked out at, a, at an early illustrative concept level. So starting from east to west, there's the marina space, which is the most kind of formal of the spaces. It's about a lower level walkway and an upper level dining terrace separated by um, a seating element, which was all about looking to the beautiful architecture, Marina City, the Corn Cob Towers from the Yankee Foxtrot Wilco album right across here, like some of the most magnificent buildings in Chicago. And so the idea of creating a space that's all about seeing that um, experience of the river and the buildings. So here you see that lower level walkway and the upper level walkway and design drawing and some of the seating elements. The second was the cove. This was all about the rise of human powered craft on the Chicago River. You see a lot more people on kayaks today than you ever have and there's no place for them to stop. So we wanted to create an entire block for them to get out and experience the river. So we lowered everything down to kayak level on the river which is about six inches above normal pool so it floods often but it was the whole idea that you could get in and out of your kayak, use a restroom, get a soda, um, you could get on and off here. The River Theater, which we worked with Carol Ross Barney, our architect, our amazing partner and architect in Chicago, who designed this incredibly bombastic staircase that has slicing through it a 5% um, handicap ramp, uh, negotiating that 17 feet of grade change from Upper Wacker down to the river. That also forms as kind of a seating space. The water plaza, which was about giving kids a place to play in water next to the river. The Chicago River is too dirty to touch and to occupy, but giving them a place to simulate that experience right at the river's edge and a kind of early rendering of that experience. And then lastly, my favorite, this is the jetty. The Friends of the Chicago River had built this little milk jug wetland installation. Has anyone ever seen this? It was literally like milk jugs with like wetland plants that they were floating out in the middle of this dead river. 
And it was when we first saw it, we thought, oh my God, that is amazing, right? They're, they're trying to create fish habitat. They called it the fish hotel. It was like a little stopping point on the river. And we said, what an idea. What if we did that kind of as a whole space, just filled it up with these floating wetlands and made a whole space that was about fishing and fish habitat and education about the life that happens below the surface. And that's what gave origin to the idea of the jetty, um, which you see here from an early perspective. So the first three blocks were constructed over the course of two years. Really interesting funding story. If anyone wants to talk about that, it was basically paid for by a federal um, loan um, from the federal government that's being paid back by revenues generated from the project over the next 30 years. So again, this kind of public-private issue, uh, pretty prevalent. Um, but these three blo blocks opened. What I would like to do now, oh, is show you my Twitter feed <laughs> and my email. Um, let's see, is show you this video that, uh, that we produced. So this video was really meant to pay homage to the people who constructed the first three blocks of the Riverwalk because it was crazy amazing to watch this construction because they were building land on the river and they were building it um, by water side. So everything was brought in by barge and the whole city's like still happening and then they're digging this, making this new land. So I'm gonna show you. And it's also to pay homage to the incredible team. because like most construction sites you work on um, you know there's a fence around it and no one can see and you just hear it and there's like a rendering but like the Chicago River Wall was built with people looking down on it the whole time and you can go there today and the new part is um, happening as well sorry about that uh, yeah do I want to recover okay so back to the end of story two So this was the marina, for instance, uh, in its existing condition before the construction, and that's the finished product. So it opened uh, in June of last year. 
Um, the marina room here, as you can see, that idea of really dropping that elevation of the walkway as close to the water as possible, creating these seating moments so that it's not just about circulation, it's about place making as well. Um, enabling boats to actually dock up here. So that's part of the revenue generation story is allowing boat, boats to actually tie up and get out and have dinner and get back on the boat. And um, that's actually happening. You see the restaurant terrace here, which had a couple of restaurants. It was always the dream that you could come down to the river and have a glass of wine, and look at those buildings and um, you can, it's really nice. So part of this was working with a really tight section. You know, we only had about 40 horizontal feet, including the existing dock wall in our 25 foot build out. So how do you make place happen in such a tight section and still enable circulation to pass through? So it's got the terrace and then this grade change, the walkway, and then a grade change down to the water. And negotiating that grade change on the uphill side, on the city side, is this folded wooden um, seating element that performs like a high back bench on the bottom level and then folds up to become this bar level at the top. It's kind of really active all the time and, and sort of beautiful when it's empty and it's also really beautiful when it's packed full of people. This is the second room in that sequence, the cove, and so this is the one that was all about human-powered craft. We just happened to get this one photograph when there's not a kayak in sight, but we'll show you some others where there are. Um, but this one was really inspired by cove landscape, by kind of low, shallow, sandy beach landscape. So all of the planting is really grass landscapes with some small tree planting. Um, and then in the center of the space, we really lowered that whole edge down as close to the water as possible and created these things we called the, I called them the um, river stones, the construction guys called them the, the beans or the pillows, um, but they're really these precast seating elements that allow different types of seating to happen along that edge. And uh, it really has become both a place for kayakers to kind of wait and take safe haven and pause. Um, but also in the arcade, in this room in particular, there's a company called Urban Kayaks that actually you can come here and rent a kayak and take off onto the river here. So a really unique opportunity in a very urban stretch. Um, every time you pass under one of the bridges, you have um, the bridges above you, which are basically open kind of metal grading systems. So there's, this, there's always been this fear about things getting dropped on pedestrians. So Carol Ross Barney, the genius that she is, came up with these metal sheets that actually cover the path. So they provide protection from above, but also kind of bring light and reflectivity down into those dark spaces under the bridges and really become, again, kind of a real selfie moment. Lots of pictures if you Instagram it um, of people. Here's that idea of the river theater, this uh, incredibly bombastic staircase that goes from uh, bridge house to bridge house with the five, less than 5% walkway uh, running through it. So here you see that at the lower level, the trees kind of coming up through the stairs in a really interesting way. And this is that ADA walkway and the connection between the upper level and the lower level. So those three opened. The next phase is under construction now. The whole project was about $100 million, so 50 million for the first three blocks, 50 million for the three blocks that are under construction now. And the two that are um, most interesting right now are the water plaza and the jetty. And so this is again that kind of interactive water experience and then this sort of interactive fish experience, which um, I'm really excited about. And we put a lot of love into trying to figure out how to make floating wetlands float, <laughs> <laughs> fingers crossed, um, and also be able to brave the elements and stay out there seasonally. So they're basically like boats that are moored. They kind of rise and fall with the tide of the water, or the flood dynamics of the water. But hopefully next time you see me, I'll be talking about the jetty. So last project, biggest scale. This is uh, a big departure from the Lawn on D for sure, and a pretty significant departure from Chicago. This is the macro scale. This is really regional planning. It's actually kind of na national regional planning, a competition that we just finished called Changing Course. So we were asked, as I showed you earlier, um, part of my sort of strange career has taken me into the realm of resiliency planning. Um, one of my earliest projects with a new principal at Sasaki in 2008 was a small riverfront project in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, um, that I was there June 12th and 13th in 2008, kicking off this new little waterfront park project when the city flooded. It got uh, inundated with about 11 feet of water, um, covered all of downtown and about 10 uh, neighborhoods nearby and happened to be there to witness that and then happened to be there for the next four or five years doing all the recovery planning. And that led to us getting involved in the post Sandy landscape work uh, on the Jersey Shore and it got us involved in this work um, at the Mississippi River mouth on the Gulf Coast uh, near New Orleans. A team called Baird Engineers asked us to be part of their team to help 
with this competition, which was really looking at the Mississippi River um, and the challenge of land loss at the foot of the Mississippi River. For those of you that don't know the problem of the Mississippi River, it's actually kind of one of the most amazingly visible signs of uh, our impending doom. No, I don't want to say that. Um, of climate change. <laughs> it, it's actually it's actually losing about a football field of wetland, which you see in red here every day. They lose a football field of wetland. It's both because of sea level rise and subsidence of the soil, um, and also because of the Mississippi River dynamics, which have been um, really human altered. Um, but it's got a sort of ripple effect of a whole bunch of things. As we lose that land, it means less protection for New Orleans from storm surge. Uh, it means declines in, in, in fish populations and the ecology, which is an incredible part of the economy of New Orleans. So it's just this wicked problem. Uh, you see us kind of starting to spell some of those um, challenges out. So just to orient you, New Orleans is outlined in black. Those are the levees that surround New Orleans. Uh, this is the uh, river as it comes down to what they call the Birdfoot Delta, an incredibly long stretch of channelized river between New Orleans and the Gulf Coast of Mexico. So as we said, a lot of challenges here as they lose wetlands, uh, it impacts communities and businesses, it impacts the fisheries. Um, there's a concern that the fish are reaching a tipping point where they no longer will be able to be productive if something's not done. And then there's also, you know, our whole national economy relies on the Mississippi River as the shipping channel to the rest of the world. And so as uncertainty grows about how the river will perform with all of these dynamics, um, so comes uncertainty to the national shipping and navigation industry, which is a pretty significant economy. So you have this kind of like national mega problem, and then you also have this very small <coughs> sense of community of the people that live in the Delta. Has anyone seen the Beasts of the Southern Wild movie? Yeah, yeah, friends in the front row have. Um, it, it's, a, it's a landscape of people that have really sought to be isolated from sort of normal society. They're really distrustful of the government. I, I don't mean to generalize, these are sort of big sweeping generalizations, but, but in general, the people of the Delta tend to work multiple jobs. Sometimes they oil rig and shit, um, will fish in the same year. They kind of, uh, a lot of them are sort of nomadic in the way that they, they work. And they tend to live in these incredibly tight, small communities of, you know, between 50 and 150 homes. Um, and the homes are all sort of on stilts and they're in like these little fishing villages. Um, and so it's, and they live in this incredibly risky landscape of the Delta where every storm that comes pushes them in and then back out again because it's where their livelihoods are. So it's a really complex problem because it's, it's about people's lives. It's about a unique culture of this place. Um, mm -hmm. And it's also about this sort of impending environmental force. So the competition was all about, is there another way of thinking about land loss here that hasn't been thought of before? They have a coastal master plan for the state of Louisiana that was completed in 2012 that was showing some strategies that could show some improvement, but, but there's a quick realization that those small improvements aren't gonna add up to the kind of change that needs to happen to save New Orleans and to save the Delta landscape. So the competition um, brought in experts from all over the country. There were three teams that competed. This was our team, the Baird team. It was truly one of the most exciting interdisciplinary opportunities I've ever been part of because we had this team of 35 people that would come together at University of New Orleans and we would sit in a room for three days at a time and we would talk about all the science behind what was happening. We would talk about the social science behind what was happening and we would brainstorm ideas and test ideas with each other. Um, leading to our conclusion. And I have to say the Baird uh, engineers were extraordinary leaders in that pursuit. But we also had, you know, we had scientists. We had one guy who's just spent his whole life understanding like sediment in the Delta. And another guy who only has spent his time on like young oysters. And, but we had like a lot of those guys and women uh, and it was pretty powerful. So for those of you that don't understand how the Mississippi worked, it used to be like a garden hose lying uh, on the ground with water coming out of it. And it would sort of move lazily side to side and spew its water and all of its sediment. And uh, it, over many thousands of years, would create these what they call deltaic lobes, basically these ridge lines of sediment. And then it would move and it would keep creating those. And so you, you wind up with this system of ridge lines that are like fingers. And then in between those ridge lines are these uh, bays that are basically these incredibly product productive um, saltwater estuarine um, environments for wetlands and, and fish species. So what our team uh, came to understand was that that whole landscape and this perimeter, kind of the historic extent of the Delta landscape, was created by 400 million tons of sediment coming down the Mississippi <coughs> River and really letting the river kind of move it, right? Move it across and kind of spray it across the landscape. 
So two things happened. First, we channelized the Mississippi River as a navigation channel. So all of a sudden, you took something that was sort of lazy and, and moving, and you pushed it and squeezed it. So it's moving faster <coughs> in one straight line now. And so it basically takes all of its sediment like a fire hose and shoots it off into the Gulf of Mexico. So it's part of the reason why you're not getting the replenishment of the wetlands you once did. The other channel is all, the other challenge is all along the Mississippi. There are all of these new dams and other pieces of infrastructure that are holding back sediment that used to come down the river. So as you can see here, we've gone from 400 million tons a year to 140 million tons a year. So just when you logic that out, even if you captured every single one of those grains of sediment, you're still going to wind up with a smaller delta than what exists today. So that was one key finding was we need to start thinking about basically a retreat strategy. How do you move from a big landscape to something that's much tighter and smaller but sustainable over time? Some folks have argued that dredging is a solution to actually bring in land and, and sediment from other places, but our team felt that was really unsustainable, both in terms of the cost of what it would take. This was a slide kind of showing what it would take to, to mechanize that process versus what it would cost to actually use the sediment that's coming down the river and, and harness really the natural land building power of the Mississippi. And it was our team's speculation that these little small kind of diversions that the um, state master plan had planned, little openings that would capture some of the water and put it into the wetlands just wasn't going to cut it. That in order to save New Orleans, you really had to capture every grain of sediment. So today, this is our um, way of communicating how much sand um, sediment capture you get from decaf to extra bold. Hope knows I've had like, what, 15 cups of coffee today? <laughs> Just the way I think about the world. Yeah. My husband knows too. <laughs> okay, anyway, so, so today you catch about, we catch about 35% of the sediments that come down the river. The master plan from 2012 upped that by about 15%, so you could capture about 15%, and most of those were with these little diversions that would capture some of the river water into those basins. But we were saying, no, you really need to be somewhere in that 80 to 100 percent range and really kind of amp up the river building. And excitingly, we were able to prove that if you do kind of go bold, extra bold, extra caffeinated, that you could actually see some immediate benefits that would make it worthwhile to think about doing something so dramatic. So let me start by showing you how to go bold. The engineers had this idea of what they called managed distributaries, which we've drawn as these little cute little faucets. But Really what they suggested is that you pick a few basins, a few of these kind of like interfinger basins, and you actually just create entirely new Mississippi River mouths. So you unleash the full potential of the Mississippi River into one of these basins, capturing as much water and sediment as you possibly can. So if you imagine that these are the <coughs> basins and we're putting these faucets there, that you could start to build over time, and that maybe you build more of these faucets over time, you kind of adaptively manage. That came up in one of the crits today, right? You try it, see how it works over a decade, see how it's working, adjust your plans, and try again. So it could become this kind of system of, of basin kind of approaches to see um, how to build more land. So the reason why this has never been done before is because that basin will become an entirely freshwater basin. Overnight, you open up the river, you send it into this basin, it goes from being an estuarine, you know, saltwater environment to a completely freshwater environment. So you, you basically kill everything that's living there, you push it away. And because right now, New Orleans, everyone lives within a basin, they don't think about it as a system of basins, that's never been able to happen, right? Because there's whole livelihoods. But if you don't do this, it means that all of the basins are going to have problems. So our strategy was to say, accept the losses of that particular fish species in one basin, let it persist in another, and keep cycling through this and changing them over time. So this was one demonstration of kind of the percentage of water and sediment that's coming down the river. As it, today, it kind of parts ways um, north of New Orleans. But we were suggesting this first basin, the Breton Basin, was a good place to start because it has the lowest population density. It's in a really important point, point in, the, in the river system. I'll show you in a second. Maybe it's next. Yeah, OK. Um, so start in this one basin. And we think those little green bows show kind of like over 25 or 30 years how much land we think we can build based on other precedents in the region. And as I said, if you do this, if you take the river out of its channel further upstream, much further upstream, just south of New Orleans, Immediately, you get some navigational and flood protection benefits that make it worthwhile. So first, you're creating, ideally, you're creating land, as you see it there in that Breton Basin, which I showed you earlier, in a place where, historically, that's where storms come in, and that's the way tidal action works on New Orleans. So you can see that hurricane, how it's moving. 
So if you could build land there, it could help to buffer New Orleans. That's sort of one benefit. But more importantly, if you take the river out of the channel, this is the Breton Basin right here. So it's, it's where that brown line stops is where we're saying you open up this new right mouth of the river. The rest of the river channel can continue to be the navigation channel. It can still have water and it can still move boats. And so that's not an issue. Um, but all of a sudden, you're, the hydraulic gradient of what you're doing to the river is further upstream. And then you open it up and it instantly drops the river level in New Orleans by about eight feet. So it goes overnight, could go from eight feet lower, which means all of a sudden you've gone from having a risk of, of flood, well, a hundred year flood once in every 10 years, something like one in a hundred. So you've are automatically kind of opened up a new kind of flood protection. You know, so we talked about kind of the benefits of this, that there would be these new wetlands that you could um, restore some critical habitat. You could address um, issues of hypoxia, which is sort of the, the deadening of the water in the Gulf. Um, you could start to stabilize and provide uh, new uh, species for industry. We thought if you really could do this, if you could really create this new mouth of the Mississippi, it would kind of be a wonder of the world. It would be something no one had ever done before. And even that could be kind of an economic generator for the region, that people would come here to both witness that and participate in it. But it also could become a job training center. A lot of the folks that live in the Delta today, um, especially the next generation folks that live in the Delta today, don't want to fish and they don't want an oyster. It's not what they want for their livelihood. They just don't have access to really any other option. So the idea was this could become a job training center. It could be something we kept on calling it kind of like a blue lab or a water discovery. We called it the Delta Discovery Center, but a new kind of um, infrastructure that could help to support a changing community. We also talked about our, our team went pretty deep into the social science of the Delta and the kinds of cultures that live there and this whole challenge of these small scale communities because most of the flood um, sort of FEMA models of relocating people are based one household at a time. But these are really tight knit small communities that want to move in it, as a group and there's no way to enable that right now. So we were suggesting this idea of a kind of managed retreat um, idea where you would actually construct protected places high and dry that could be temporary safe havens for these communities to come to during storm events. But over time, those would actually become more permanent residents and maybe the, the places that they were leaving in the Delta would become a temporary place. So kind of switching a sense of seasonality and, and sort of uh, occupation of the land. And we had like ideas about how that could work with existing funding systems as well. So here's that Breton Basin, that kind of idea of the new Mississippi River mouth, kind of opening it up and letting the Mississippi do what it wants to do, which is to move and to drop its sediment sooner onto the land. Uh, you see New Orleans and orange in the back there. Um, we were excited because we thought, you know, this is something that cities around the world that live in port locations will be dealing with in the coming years and so if we could set a different precedent in New Orleans, this really important place, that it could become this real model for the rest of the world as well um, and could be sort of something that the United States does that's exceptional and others can learn from in the same way the Dutch have really kind of coined uh, the, the dredging industry or captured the dredging industry. So those are my three stories. Do you guys feel, landscape architects, you feel empowered to make change? <laughs> yeah? Okay, so how many of you are planners? We have planners. Nice. I love planners. How many are architects? Right on! I love architects! <laughs> I love it! I can't wait to hear what you want to ask me. And landscape architects? Cool. I love architects seeing what landscape architects can do. Like, seriously, we're not parsley around the pig or shrubs around the building. Like, we're making powerful change. So um, that's sort of my thesis. Um, so I take questions. Uh, Hi. kind of interacted with the people in that place to understand how they're kind of dealing with those hard decisions they have to make yeah. about their communities and their lives? So the competition was a closed competition, so no, we weren't actually allowed to. The competition was run by a, a 10 organization consortium that included the Greater New Orleans Foundation, the Van Allen Institute, the Rockefeller Institute. Um, they brought in stakeholders for us to deal with, to talk to, and they also insisted that every member, every team, there were three teams competing, had a, a, a knowledgeable social scientist who had worked in the Delta um, as part of their team. It was incredibly frustrating for those of us that do a lot of public outreach and public planning to not have that dialogue. And as part of, our, part of our competition entry, I didn't show you any of it, but we actually proposed kind of an outreach engagement strategy. And I just want to tell you one cool part, because my husband's here and he'll totally get a kick out of this. 
So, so really, what we, I know, what we want to appeal to is not necessarily the people that are living in the Delta right now, the older people, because this problem is going to be happening over decades. What we really talked about was how do we get to the kids of the Delta so that they understand what's happening in this landscape. And so we have this group of, of like nerds from MIT that work at our office that make custom software for decision making and for public outreach. And we came up with this idea of creating a game we called Delta Craft. Um, so <laughs> got it? Yeah. Sort of like loosely based on Minecraft, which our daughter is like obsessed with right now, um, where kids could play with sediment loads and try to understand like, okay, if I place sediment upstream, what happens if I place it here? So. We were sort of forecasting what a creative engagement strategy would look like for a 50, 200 year problem like this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and then there's that, um, like the $2 billion lawsuit in those communities for that. They're just it's a really it's wicked. A, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, these are people that don't trust the government, to, many of them to begin with, and, and for a lot of good reasons. Yeah. And so trying to understand that this is a process to work with them is challenging. I hope we get to keep going. It's sort of up in the air what they'll do with the results of the competition mm -hmm. right now. Yeah. So. Yes, sir. Uh, can you speak more towards like the interdisciplinary nature of your firm mm -hmm. uh, and what is it, maybe some headaches that come along with oh. that and some good <laughs> things that come along with that? Yeah. Okay. The good thing is, the good thing is, I mean, I didn't know, I didn't know what landscape architecture was when I started Sasaki. I had an architecture degree and I went to work there and so I learned on the job what landscape architects do and then I became one. Oh. Um, but my real joy has been getting to know what planners and urban designers do um, and working in the same building with them. So, so changing course, we do a lot of work at that scale, like the Jersey Shore work, where it's planning and landscape working hand in hand. And that's a really powerful duo that you don't often see. I think the power in our office is really this idea, and I don't know <laughs> if this appeals to you guys. I mean, I think about this as a firm, as one of the firm leaders, and I get really excited that there's no dominant discipline, you know, that we really try to have equal voice at every table, that the landscape architects aren't sort of brought in later, that we're always there. You can imagine that's kind of a management nightmare. And I think when we go to like interview for jobs or we're talking to clients, a lot of times we don't have like, we don't have the single person. We, we, we I was telling, was I telling you earlier? We're not Superman, we're like the Avengers, you know? We don't, we're, we, we're, we're like, uh, we're scrapping together all of our skills that this one holds back water and this one, you know, and that's how we sort of perform. So it, ma it makes, that's actually Bruce Mao's expression, but when I heard it, I thought that's like so Sasaki that we're the Avengers. Um, so that's the biggest headache is really like, you know, how do you manage, like who's ultimately who's in charge, you know, who's making this decision and how do you take all these inputs from all these different places and make something smart and clear, right? Are you, uh, have you worked in an interdisciplinary firm before? Uh, in a product design firm, oh, we cool. had engineers, architects, yep. graphic designers, and yep. it was constantly the question of uh, who takes lead and yep. in what ways do you communicate and like share files? Even yeah. Or my favorite one that I always talk with my team about is sort of like knowing when your skill set stops and when someone else's starts. We have a lot of architects, uh, we all do it. We all do it as designers that think they can design landscape and we have a lot of landscape architects that think they can plan and really knowing, and we have everyone thinks they can do graphic design and PS graphic designers are like way better than us at it. All of, all of the change in coursework was done by graphic designers. I think you can see it, it's all about communication. But training our staff to understand, our teams to understand when their skill set stops and when they need to bring in someone that's better than them at it. You know what I mean? Like, no, no, really. Now you need to hand this over to the expert who knows what they're doing in that. That's another challenge. Um, is that something that you assess by project? Is that something that at the beginning of the project you decide this is something that is really led by an urban designer and then you start to fill in? Or is it, yeah. how does that conversation Yeah. Happen? I mean, yeah, and that's another big challenge that we have is figuring out those, those dynamics. Usually it's pretty obvious to us based on what the client need is. We always start with kind of what is the client need and then we ass assess a team. Sometimes we get it wrong. Sometimes we read it as a landscape problem and it's an urban design problem. Because, you know, those are, there's some real gray area there about what's what, right? Um, and a lot of times our biggest challenge is always that we, again, we t tend to come at it that we bring one of everything to the table. And when you go to a, a job interview or you're with a client, that can be very confusing, but it's sort of how we work. So it's hard for us to know when not to do that. Um, yeah, but we do, we, we sort of assess it at the beginning. And we, we have the, we're nimble enough to be able to pull people on and off when we realize, oh, it's not really that, it's this, which is pretty, pretty powerful too. 
the, the, a lot of the flood recovery work, for instance, like the work in Cedar Rapids, you know, it started as a landscape problem that was a small problem, and overnight it grew to something way bigger. And it, was, it really spoke to the capacity of the practice to say, okay, we need like an economist, we need a graphic, we need, we, and we could pull it all. And we tend to have these sort of long relationships where we kind of keep changing the problem and changing the team to meet the problem. Hi. In the, did you say plan choices? Plan choices, yeah. Yeah, so we worked with a really extraordinary landscape architect named Terry Ryan, who's a um, really extraordinary Chicago native, and she did all of our plant selection, and it was a big part of the conversation how to plant, especially in the flood dynamics. The water quality issue in the Chicago River is, is again, it's a wicked problem. I mean, it's it really, like, it's disgusting, and you shouldn't touch it, and you shouldn't swim in it. So this whole idea that we were going to get people closer to the river's edge at first was a, sort of a new idea. It's <laughs> been, <laughs> they, I mean, people really see it as like a sewer. They see it as like an open, open sewer. And so, you know, I think, and, and we've been challenged, you know, it's funny, every time I talk about any of our work at ASLA, someone always brings up the watershed issue or the major water quality issues which are exactly right, it's what we should be talking about, but it's never anything that can be solved within the project boundary. So all you can really do is within your project boundary is what's the smartest thing we can do to change people's mindset about this resource, right? How can we make them see that this is more than a place to dump disgustingness? Um, the good news is that the water quality <coughs> in the Chicago River is getting better. It is getting better, and Mayor Daly's goal was fishable swimmable, and that's what they're still moving towards, so uh, hopefully over time. And with, you know, every community is, is still, still has combined sewer outfall. So it's everywhere. It's not just Chicago. It's every city in this country has that in some, in some dimension. So, so everyone's moving away from that, which is a really good thing. Yes, ma'am. One more. One more. I right, do it. Just bring it. For the changing course for where y'all were <laughs> yeah, I can't say that there really was. I mean, there was a lot of discussion about how you do that responsibly, right? How you unleash the power of the greatest North American river into a small area all at once. Um, so there was a lot of, uh, sorry, <laughs> I like that you like that. <laughs> there was a lot of discussion about earthwork and gates and infrastructure and also flow dynamics. Um, the fishing, the, you know, our constituency for the changing course competition included like Shell Oil was on the panel and the Army Corps and the big port, the port of New Orleans. And so the, the shippers were real nervous about making a turn past the new opening and getting swept into this new wetland. So there was a lot of modeling done to work that out. But the whole question about how you stepping stone species, yeah. We, we dealt with it a little bit on the Jersey Shore where we were working with the genius um, landscape ecologist, restoration ecologist Stephen Handel, where it was the opposite issue. We were talking about inland migration of species over time with climate change. So on the Jersey Shore, he came up with this idea he called habitat engines, that you actually start planning for ecosystems to move inland over time, <coughs> but you construct some new ones along the way so that as it happens, there's like stepping stones. So I think this is a real this is a real opportunity for our profession to start thinking about these kinds of change, whether it's the, the river changing or the ocean coming in, and how we plan intelligently for it and get people out of harm's way, frankly. Yeah. I guess that was the last question. Everyone's like really quiet. Did you enjoy it? Yeah. yeah?